When Trudeau taxes the energy of the farmer who makes the food and the trucker who ships the food, he taxes the people who buy the food. Enough. Canadians cannot afford to pay any more. I am pleased to join with my Conservative team from Atlantic Canada to reiterate and re-announce that we as Conservatives will axe the Trudeau tax on your gas, heat and groceries. Pierre Polyev is bringing a familiar tune for his supporters to his summer barbecue circuit tour of Atlantic Canada, Axe the Carbon Tax. It is a message at least partly echoed by Atlantic Premiers, but on an issue the Liberal government here in Ottawa would very much like to consider settled. Let's bring back the front bench to talk about that. Brian Gallant, Lisa Raitt, Tom Mulcair and Rob Benzie. Brian, I'll start with you since you're out in Atlantic Canada. The Premiers out there, including a Liberal in Newfoundland and Labrador, Premier Andrew Fury, have expressed support, not specifically for Pierre Polyev, uh, himself, but for the position that, that he has uh, made very clear, which is that the carbon tax is unaffordable at this point in time. Does that make this a vulnerability for the Liberal government, even though in 2021 they were very quick to mention that two-thirds of Canadians voted for a party which did was in favour of the carbon tax? Well, it's never easy to ask anybody to pay more, especially nowadays when affordability is top of mind for everyone. There's a cost of uh, crisis of uh, of cost uh, going up, and, and I, I know it's top of mind for everyone. So it's never easy, and it's even even all that much more difficult now. So the Atlantic Premier sending the letter to the Prime Minister, uh, I'm sure, had a few reasons as to why they did that. But the first one is definitely because it's about to, the, the prices are about to go up, and they want to put their stake in the ground to say that they're fighting it and they don't want it to happen. So people in Atlantic Canada are aware of that. Um, and look, I think the vulnerability uh, of of the immediate price uh, increase is is certainly one that is real, but. I think the greater vulnerability is looking like a party is not serious on climate change. And, and I do believe that climate change is the largest challenge facing us all at the moment. Uh, and certainly on the East Coast, we, we feel the effects of climate change, uh, as does the rest of the country, differently here, but we certainly feel it. Uh, so I do believe that although the immediate pressure of the price increases is, is, is yes, a vulnerability, the long-term biggest danger is for a political party to not look like they're serious about combating climate change. And I think that Poliev may be putting himself in that position. And, and I do think Canadians care deeply about that. They want the right policies and they definitely want affordability to be on the top of the list of the federal politicians and, and parties, but they also want the government to fight climate change. So I do think that Poliev should tread a little careful on the message and have in parallel something at least to put in the window to say that this is how we, if elected, will play our part to combat climate change. Do you think that's true, Lisa, that it's a, a political vulnerability for the Liberals right now, but in the long term, potentially more for the Conservatives? So everyone's got to do a little bit of explaining, right? From the Liberal point of view, they have to explain to Atlantic Canadians who are suddenly going to have this 14 cents a litre charge on top of their gas price right now, which is which is pretty high, quite frankly, and including the farmers getting upset by it. They have to convince Canadians that their gas, their carbon tax is actually going to go to reduce effects of climate change. And they have to make that case. They can they have to do more than just say that it's obvious it's happening. They have to make the clear case mm -hmm. and, and the Atlantic Canadians have to believe in them. On the other side, I mean, Mr. Polyev has a lot of explaining to do as well. He's got to say, well, I'm not going to have the carbon tax, but I still believe that we have to make sure we're doing the right thing with respect to the climate, and this is what I'm going to do. So everyone's got some explaining to do, and it's going to be who can message it the best and who can actually get the message home that they want to hear. And I think it's fascinating to see that, once again, we're fighting over a carbon tax. Yeah, it is fascinating, Tom, because I think, like I said in the preamble, in 2021, there was almost a sense like, okay, Canadians have spoken, they have endorsed it by a majority, you know, if you combine the vote for the NDP and the, and the Liberals, parties that do favour the carbon tax, maybe that part of the debate, like it has been in other, other jurisdictions, is now behind us. But, but the exact opposite really has happened. Yeah, and to be fair, Aaron O'Toole definitely was in favor of putting a price on carbon. His mechanism was a bit complicated, but the basic yeah. notion was there. You know, it, there's an interesting contradiction in my view here, because Trudeau gets to play on the side of the angels throughout this whole debate, but the result's never been there with the Liberals. He's been there for eight years. Look at the reports, the consistent reports of Canada's Environment and Sustainable Development Commissioner. We've never met our international obligations. So people who follow this closely know that. The contradiction is also on Poilievre's side, because he's drawing in a lot of young people. 
He's telling them, look, you're going to be the first generation of Canadians who don't do as well as your parents. You're going to have difficulty ever buying a house. Mm -hmm. At its core, that's an argument based on an essential tenet of sustainable development, the responsibility of governments to take into account the effect on future generations. So instead of going with the flow of something that's working for him, he puts up a barrier because a lot of those young people also want action on climate. And how can you plausibly say you are a party that wants to become the, the governing power in a G7 country, but you don't want to do anything about climate change? How, how can you show up internationally and do that? How can you even talk to the young people that you've been managing to draw in and have that position? So I think that Poilievre's going to have to pick a lane at some point because he, he seems sincere when he talks to young people about that, and that's why he's drawing them in. But he's just going to push them back out, Bashi, unless he figures out how to talk to them about the real obligation of governments to deal with this crisis, which is climate change and global warming. It's interesting, um, uh, Rob, because I, um, I was listening to his comments today, and it was almost the first hint of what we might expect in that vein, because he has not presented a, a plan. And every time you ask the Conservatives, I think the last time I did on, on the show, they said, well, we're not going to reveal it right now, but, but obviously we don't know exactly when they will. He said, uh, and I'm distilling it right now, but basically, I'm not going to make carbon intensive things m more expensive for you. I'm going to make carbon free alternatives less expensive, which to me echoes the policies, for example, pursued south of the border by mm -hmm. Joe Biden, an example they could cite and say, hey, he's doing it without mm -hmm. punishing consumers. Uh, they haven't yet, but, but I imagine I, that's sort of like the hint I got of where they might go. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and you're right, Bashi. He hasn't spelled out what he's going to do, and, and Tom is right. Aaron O'Toole tried. It was a very complicated system that the Conservatives were proposing in 2021, but it at least acknowledged that they had to tackle this issue uh, in a serious way. I, but having said that, if, if the next election, which I still believe won't be till 2025, if it's fought on climate change, I'm not really sure that that's a great frame for Pierre Polyev. I would much rather be talking about cost of living, and I guess that's what they're trying to do. But, but the, it, voters in Ontario, voters in Quebec certainly, are, 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 are concerned about the climate. They are really worried about uh, uh, these carbon-intensive uh, industries and things like that. And I, I just think if you're, if you're talking climate change, that's not necessarily, that, that may be playing into what Justin Trudeau wants to be talking about. Even even though, to Tom's point, they have never met any climate change target, ever. Okay. Yeah, not, they, they, as they would say, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. 2050, maybe by 2050. Right. <laughs> History doesn't bode well, yeah. Okay, well, that's the big one, I guess. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. I want to thank the front bench uh, for your contributions all season and tonight. I really appreciate it. I hope you all have a wonderful summer. Brian Gallant, Lisa Ray, Tom Mulcair, and Rob Benzie.